Hola, buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Welcome a esta sesión inaugural del Máster Universitario en Enseñanza y Aprendizaje de Idiomas mediante la Tecnología. Mi nombre es Gisela Grañena y yo soy la directora de este máster, este nuevo máster de la Universidad Uberta de Cataluña, la UOC. Um, en esta sesión de hoy, os voy a dar la, la estructura que seguiremos, haré una introducción breve al, al máster y ya inmediatamente pasaré a presentar a nuestro ponente invitado, que como sabéis es Scott Thormory. Scott hablará durante unos 30-40 minutos y ya luego volveré yo a centrarme en el máster para daros unos, unos, cuantos detalles, unos cuantos detalles más. Hemos decidido pasar el, el turno de preguntas, todas las preguntas que podáis tener durante la sesión, al final. Entonces, mientras estamos hablando tanto Scott como yo, podéis ir um, escribiendo vuestras preguntas tanto mediante el, el chat del canal de YouTube como a través de Twitter. Aquí podéis ver el, el hashtag que tenéis que utilizar. Y ya al final haremos esta, esta sesión de, de preguntas y respuestas todos juntos. Sobre el, el máster en enseñanza y aprendizaje de idiomas mediante la tecnología, os voy a dar una breve introducción, unas pinceladas de las características principales que tiene. Es un máster oficial, un máster universitario oficial de 60 créditos que estamos ofreciendo 100% en línea y en formato bilingüe. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Pues que eh, estamos ofreciéndolo tanto en español como en inglés y el estudiante tiene que elegir si quiere cursarlo en su totalidad en un idioma o en otro. Es un máster dirigido principalmente a profesionales en activo del campo de la enseñanza de idiomas, de cualquier idioma, el español, el inglés, el francés, de cualquier nivel educativo y contexto. Pueden ser contextos de aprendizaje en línea, un contexto híbrido o incluso de aula en el que se utiliza, se incorpora el uso de la tecnología. Obviamente también nos dirigimos a licenciados, graduados en filologías, en educación, traducción e interpretación y áreas, áreas relacionadas. Es un máster principalmente profesional, de orientación profesional y práctico, ¿eh? principalmente práctico, lo cual no quiere decir que no haya asignaturas un poco más teóricas, sobre todo de teoría de adquisición de segundas lenguas y también hay asignaturas de metodología de la investigación, de técnicas de análisis para aquellos estudiantes que puedan estar interesados en, en acceder a programas de doctorado posteriormente. Sobre los objetivos del máster y el por qué nos planteamos crear este, este programa. Obviamente, eh, vivimos unas circunstancias que requieren, en el ámbito en concreto y muy concretamente de la enseñanza de idiomas, donde requieren que haya profesionales formados en, en las nuevas tecnologías y sus aplicaciones y que las sepan usar de manera adecuada y con criterio. Entonces, nuestro objetivo, el objetivo de este, mar, de este máster era y es, por un lado, formar a profesionales que tengan excelentes, para que tengan excelentes conocimientos de los procesos implicados en el aprendizaje de un idioma mediante la tecnología. Queremos um, que entiendan cómo se aprende esa, esa segunda lengua a través de la tecnología y les queremos también proporcionar, proporcionar las herramientas necesarias para integrar la tecnología de forma efectiva y crítica en la enseñanza de un idioma, mediante, por ejemplo, criterios metodológicos y conceptuales. Y veréis que he resaltado la palabra, la palabra crítica, porque me prometeréis que enlace en este momento el, el máster, este programa de máster, con nuestro, con nuestro invitado, con nuestro ponente invitado, que como sabéis es Scott. Y esta es una de las razones por las cuales Scott, no la única razón, pero es una de las razones por las cuales está hoy Scott aquí. Y también me permitiréis que cambie al inglés en este momento. So I will switch into English. Um, in one of our first exchanges with, with Scott, he, he wrote the following in, in an email. He said, I'm not an entirely uncritical advocate of some of the claims that have been made for educational technology. I do acknowledge, though, that it is here to stay. And so if I criticize it, it's more in the spirit of warning against some of the more excessive claims that are made or have been made. And when I, I read this, I, I immediately realized that he, he was the right guest speaker for this event today. Because if there is something we want our students in this master to, to learn, to acquire is the skill to be critical with technology um, and with the use of technology. We want them equipped with criteria to use technology in the most effective way. Um, as I said, this is one of the reasons why Scott is here today, but not the only one. 
of course, not the only one. As you probably know, he's a very productive author. He's a language teacher. He's a teacher trainer. He's originally from New Zealand, but lives in Barcelona. He has taught and trained in several countries around the world. He's the series editor for the Cambridge Handbooks for Language Teachers that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. He has written several books. Some of them have been award-winning, such as About Language and The New A2Z of ELT. And his two latest books are Language Teaching Methods and 101 Grammar Questions. He has taught in the MA program in TESOL for the New York, for the new school in New York. He serves on the editorial board for a number of journals, such as TESOL Quarterly. He's a trustee of the Hands Up Project, which promotes drama activities for children in under-resourced regions of the Arab world. And last but not least, he's uh, the co-founder and content coordinator for Net Languages. It is definitely a, a great honor to have Scott Thornbury here with us today. And without further delay, I will just pass it over, hand it over to you, Scott, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gisela. And uh, thank you for creating this opportunity uh, for me, which originally uh, as we planned, it was going to be a, a live on-site presentation, but of course, given the circumstances, but given the um, the masters that you have uh, that we're launching today, uh, that the focus is on technology-mediated language uh, teaching and learning, uh, it seems only appropriate that we are using the available technologies to uh, to, to launch it. And, and I think it's a you know talk about a masters who's uh, it was never more needed uh, than now, a master's on this subject. Uh, so I, I, I applaud this initiative and I wish I could sort of wind back the clock and I would do, do the master's myself because everything I'm going to talk about today is stuff that I've kind of learned in the absence of studying uh, technology-mediated <coughs> language learning or learning generally uh, formally. Uh, and just to kind of before I launch into that, uh, let's. My intention was to do a kind of warmer. Uh, this is um, a gap fill uh, with the verbs taken out. Uh, we're not going to use the chat program to do this, but just read through and see if you can predict what each of the verbs is. The photo is at least 10 years out of date. And the text at the bottom situates this little exercise uh, within a unit in the master's program, which I, I've been teaching on. So this is really just to situate you. And this is the kind of thing that we do at the beginning because the subject is language analysis and this particular unit focuses on verbs. Uh, the, uh, the little warm up task, the getting to know you task is one in which I write my verbless bio, bio and then of course I invite uh, the learners to do themselves. And I'm just going to show you a quick screenshot, this works, of how this panned out. So this was last semester with my, I don't know how many students, a dozen students, each of them supplying a text with the verbs taken out and the others have to interact with the text and uh, and suggest what verbs are missing and then it's basically over to them. I have to do very little, except perhaps sometimes correct the fact that uh, they haven't uh, identified the verbs correctly. But you, you get an idea, I think, from that of how uh, how much interaction is generated by that, that little warm-up task. And then at the very end, notice that I say, uh, one of them says, I think this is actually a really interesting activity for ELL students and we'll consider giving it a try next quarter. Ah, and that is the agenda, you see. So none of these activities uh, without a certain uh, point to them in terms of what they could do with their own classes, either uh, in, in online or, in, or on site. 
So just to give you a little bit of background, uh, and I'm not promoting the New School or its master's program because it's a very different master's program from the one that the WOC uh, is launching in that it's, this one is focused on MATSOL generally and not on technology. But uh, it's situated in the New School, which is a university in New York uh, with a strong kind of, um, what, what can we say, a strong sort of social conscience, if you like, uh, and also a globalized, you know, a global perspective, even uh, even more so than the average New York uh, center of learning. Uh, and it's offered this master's program for the last 14 years or so. And I was involved in designing and teaching it right from the get-go and have been therefore teaching on this program consistently for all these, I've lost count, but I mean, I think we started in about 2007 and I teach principally these two language analysis courses, which on most MAs will be called linguistics, but we're not quite so pretentious. Um, and uh, so this is the kind of homepage of the, uh, of the language analysis course, one of them. Uh, and uh, I have, there are other courses in the program, uh, including one which is called English in the World, which I've helped design and uh, teach. What's important, I think, to point out here is that I've also taught exactly the same courses on site. So when I was lucky enough to be able to go to New York in the summer, I taught the same course, but I taught it in a classroom. And it's given me this kind of rather privileged uh, perspective on these courses to see how they work both online and also uh, on site and what the differences are, what the benefits and the disadvantages. That's really what I want to talk about today. And so these are the kinds of, these are some of the things I've learned teaching on this master's. And I'm kind of handing these over uh, in the spirit of, well, let's not reinvent the wheel. I mean, some of these are about the design of courses. And I, I appreciate that the, the um, walk course is already designed and, and up and running. So I'm not, I'm not intending to intervene in those decisions. But design decisions obviously impact on instructional decisions. And it's the instructors I'm really addressing here more than the designers. Those of you who are instructing or will be instructing on this or any other kind of similar course. And these are some of the things I've learned. And that little first activity, the verbless bio, that clearly uh, ticks those two boxes. It's interactive. You saw the degree of interaction that was generated uh, in that simple, very simple task. Uh, but also the socialization that's involved in that of people getting to know each other right from the get-go and of course obviously on an online course this is absolutely imperative uh, that you break the it's imperative in a classroom of course but it's more work needs to be done online to uh, socialize the learners so these are some of the uh, things I want to whip through in the time that we've got uh, and I will be taking uh, as Gisela said we will be taking questions at the end so um, do feel free to um, key them into the chat. I just want to make a few general points first about uh, online teaching. Um, interesting enough, or online learning, there was a tweet today from one of my ex-students, in fact, from the master's program, tweeted from California saying, I don't know about this talk about online learning. It's not online learning we're doing, it's an online school. He said, who knows what learning is going on? It's a bit you know, presumptuous to, to assume that it's all about learning. Uh, maybe it's more about teaching than learning, but those are some of the things I want to explore. So this, this quote, I think, resonates with me, that trying to make online education the same as face-to-face -face education, trying to replicate it identically, uh, will, will probably lead to less than optimal learning, uh, when in fact online education has the potential to support significant paradigm changes in teaching and learning. And that's the good news. There's a lot of benefits to online education without that I'm not talking about simply the convenience in, the, in our present situation. But nevertheless, uh, there are basic principles, I think, that need to carry over. While they may not be the same, uh, the, the, the principles, the educational principles that underpin them uh, need to be strong and consistent. Uh, and as this book, uh, this writer points out, he says, it's arguable that real change in the way education is provided need not be driven by technologies at all, nor even by new pedagogies. 
Rather, it depends on developing novel forms of organizational processes and structures. So different structures, different processes, because it's online as opposed to online. But while carefully maintaining and enhancing the pedagogical principles that remain fundamental. So those pedagogical principles, we must not uh, lose sight of them. Uh, and that's why I think I've been lucky to be able to see how you retain those pedagogical principles, both on site and online teaching the same course. What you have to change, what you have to do differently, so on. Uh, and finally, one last quote uh, before we get going on the things I actually learned. I think this is important too, that um, uh, technology in a sense, and I think we're seeing this very much at the moment as teachers have been sort of uh, airdropped into online teaching almost against their will, uh, that it brings out all sorts of stuff about education generally that perhaps wasn't explicit before. And this, just to read the quote, technology brings underlying beliefs regarding education into focus and it exaggerates them. The impl implementation of technology makes people evaluate what is core in education itself, which has hitherto been implicit. And I think a lot of teachers are engaged engaging with this as we speak you know what is it that we can jettison but what is core and what uh and what values does this suggest i have about teaching about language teaching specifically um and i think you know you look at in any any context any educational context there's often a kind of split if you like uh between two polarities which i've kind of I mean, this is very schematic and simplified, but on the one hand, you've got the sort of what some people call the acquisition metaphor of learning, that learning is all about taking an input. You're acquiring facts, factoids, information, as opposed to the participation or experiential mode of learning. And I think, again, this comes up very strongly when you contrast on in class learning and teachers who may be very happy doing kind of participatory activities in a classroom, but when they move in front of a computer, suddenly became much more transmissive because they don't know what else you can do maybe with the technology. So these are the sort of uh, these values and beliefs that, that are, as I say, kind of um, made explicit, if you like, or brought to the surface through the experience of making the adjustment into online uh, education. So let's go back to my list of the things that I've learned. And as I say, the first four things relate more to design. And I'm far from me to presuppose what good design is, is I'm not, I, I, I mean, I designed the courses in the sense that I wrote the courses and, uh, and I've taught the courses and I've adapted the courses. And I guess these are the things that relate more to the adaptations over these 12 or however many years. These are things I started to realize really matter. And the first one is this is kind of obvious one of simplicity. It's very tempting, especially now. And I think back when we started in 2007 or something, we had fewer function functionalities in our platform than we do now. It's very tempting to kind of want to use this app and that app and the other thing and the other thing. And what happens, of course, is that you overload the program to the to breaking point. If you look at the, the, the program that we use, the platform was called Canvas. We started off using Blackboard, we switched to Canvas. That was another story. Uh, but these are some of the questions or the features that are offered by Canvas. I mean, in their kind of uh, their help program. So I, I just kind of cut and paste it, but there's a ton of different things here that you could be doing. Now, this is very off putting, particularly for somebody who's not used to working online. I mean, basically, I. Uh, I tend to be much more parsimonious in terms of what I choose to use. As uh, John Hattie points out in terms of education generally, adding more into the teaching situation may not necessarily be as powerful in return as choosing the optimal smaller set of what leads more directly to learning outcomes. So that smaller set, I think, is what we want to focus on. It's kind of interesting going back when I've been researching this talk, looking at some of the old the books that are online education been, and language teaching for been around a long time. This is from the University of uh, Indiana. Ah, how appropriate. And this is the, um, Giselle, I had no idea, but this is from 1999, uh, a course, an online course. And I don't know if you can see, but if you look at the menu down the left there, home, orientation, syllabus, lecture notes, announcements, tests, grade book, this is exactly the same 
as this is my course now, 2020, home, announcement, syllabus, modules, assignments, discussions. Essentially, the structure has not changed. Why? Because these are all the things, these are the things that you need. This is it. You don't actually need a lot else. Um, and I was actually made a case study for a book on online learning, uh, and they interviewed me, and they and I said I made that point in 2017. I used the most basic features of the system, and by that I mean it's very very basic. The, the design of my courses is something like this: there's a bit of input, there's some tasks that relate to that input, there's a discussion, an online discussion done asynchronously, not in real time. And then there's some kind of assignment. And you might, it, there may be a little bit of lead in uh, and a little bit of roundup, of course. But that's essentially very, very simple structure, uh, which is kind of, that's the routine and it's repeated unit after unit. Now, of course, the way the input is done and the kinds of tasks, et cetera, uh, will vary, but the structure is very, very simple. But having said that, of course, then, it, as I say, the way that the tasks or the you know the input is is presented uh, is a lot more varied than it used to be when we started. When we started in two thousand and seven, well, it doesn't seem that long ago, but we were coping with the fact that a lot of students and our students were situated all around the world did not have very powerful bandwidth. I don't know how many times I heard that term. You know, narrow bandwidth, going, couldn't get online, no connection. People with modems and things, so we couldn't use. Uh, the kinds of uh, tools that are available, video, audio, even audio, well, audio we could use. But I mean, but now I think what we've added increasingly over the years, it's not just about text, but it's about images. And of course, images are incredibly important, whatever you're teaching, uh, and audio and video. And so some examples, for example, this is, uh, again, from one of my courses. So images, powerful images. Uh, a task, let's return to that, listen to me talking, click on the thing, there's a little audio there. Uh, and then, of course, there's readings to reinforce, uh, as well as a core text, a print book. Uh, and then there are, again, audio, uh, audio input and also video, much more video now than I used to do, where, for example, summarizing discussions. And I do this because the students really like it. And one of the things that they kind of tick at the, in the evaluations, oh, we do like, now these are not in real time, these are pre-recorded, but oh no, it's so nice to see, to hear our instructor speak. And then that relates to this whole thing about the loneliness of the long distance learner. So it is video, video, video. Uh, they, they can't seem to have enough of it. And these are, you know, we're talking about six minute videos. There's nothing very sophisticated about this. On the other hand, we must not fall into the trap of thinking that multimedia presentations are actually teaching. And I mean, you know, but this is the same in classrooms. Doing a PowerPoint in a classroom is not actually teaching. Doing a PowerPoint online, he says slightly shamefacedly, is not exactly teaching. So we do need to be not carried away with the multimodality. Asynchronicity. Now, um, all of our courses are synchronous. That is to say, all of our course happens uh, uh, outside of class real time. It's not like students have to be at a certain time, at a certain place, logging in. And now there are courses that do uh, much more synchronous than ours, uh, that compete with us, uh, whether they have real time lectures and maybe three a day so that they're staged, so that people in different time zones can attend. We, um, we decided from the get-go that we wouldn't have synchronous stuff apart from uh, scheduled tutorials on Skype, for example, midway in the course. Because for one reason is because, because of the time zone issue, but, but also because people seem to learn better when they can plan their time uh, to suit themselves and they're not forced to have to. I mean, one of the advantages, of course, of a synchronous learning is you don't have to be at a certain time, a certain place. And our students are all working, teaching people. So it's not easy for them to drop everything and go online and listen or attend a discussion or whatever. Having said that, it, what's interesting in the last year or two, there's been quite a lot of pressure from the top in this un particular university to do more synchronous teaching on the online. Now, I don't know why. I don't know where that message is coming that the students want this, but our students, when we survey them, certainly 
didn't and resisted. And when we tried to schedule synchronous sessions, it was actually fairly impossible because we could never get any agreement on a time that suited everybody. Nevertheless, there are advantages, of course, for synchronicity, the immediacy. Uh, and this is the thing coming back to my on-site teaching when I was teaching these courses in real classrooms. And this is from another book. Uh, the reference I couldn't fit on the page at the moment. And this is a rather busy slide, I'm sorry. But what it's contrasting here is on site versus online, the strengths and the weaknesses. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read all this. I'm just going to quickly sort of summarize from my own experience. The strengths of the on site, the face to face, with this, the human connection, I'm going to say not just the human, but the physical connection, the, the real physicality of the classroom. You cannot underestimate that, the embodiedness of the actual learning experience. And this is actually even more important, I think, with language learning than it is about learning about uh, teaching or about linguistics or whatever. The human connection and the spontaneity, clearly those are strengths. And those are the things that I really uh, appreciated when I was teaching face-to-face -face with these students. On the other hand, of course, on the right, the flexibility of online asynchronous learning, you can do whenever you want. And also the participation, it's true. The, and I think partly this is the nature, not so much of the mode, but the time that they have, because the, it just happened that the face-to-face -face classes that I was teaching were squeezed into eight weeks of the summer, two, uh, two courses in sequence, four weeks, four weeks, incredibly intensive. So there was no time uh, for depth of reflection, and there wasn't much time in the classroom even for participation. What's interesting, I would set the same group work task. Okay, so here's a task. Picture of the phonemic chart. Okay, what could you do with this in the classroom? Can you think of three different activities you could do with a phonemic chart in the classroom? Okay, into groups, blah, 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 blah. There they go. You moving around, nice buzz, etc. But it lasts all of five, ten minutes. And some students actually haven't even been opened their mouths. They go, oh, yeah, okay, that's interesting. I've never used one. but oh, yeah. Okay, and that's it. And you get a bit of feedback, and then you maybe give an idea yourself, and then you move on. Now, when you do this on a discussion board, they've got a whole week to do it. And of course they participate, because actually they're also getting points for participation. That's another story. But they do. And they go and look up things, and they cut and paste links from the British Council website here, and the whatever there, and they react, and they respond, and so on. There's a great deal more participation and a great, greater depth of, of reflection. Now, this is because it's asynchronous. It's not happening in real time. This would not be happening if they were doing the group. Not necessarily. So the asynchronicity, and I think that's one of the things that's coming through with this online move to online or remote emergency teaching, whatever you want to call it now, that's happening because of the pandemic is that teachers are realizing that you cannot keep the students on the screen for 12 hours a day. Uh, especially young kids, and that actually a lot of useful learning, and perhaps the, the most useful learning, is done off-site yeah, in their own time, and then they come back to touch base and check in. Okay, now this is the one, engagement. Now this is really more an instructional problem, but I've put it under design. Um, I was talking to somebody recently, I just happened to bang into, who teaches on an online Delta course, the Diploma of English for Language Teachers, Delta, uh, which is run from London. And we were comparing notes on my master's program and her Delta program. And the thing we immediately came to was that it's the lack of engagement. That's what I miss. The student, you, and, and I've noticed this, particularly over the 12 years I've been teaching on this program, that the students even seem less engaged. And I think it's, a, I don't know, but I think it's a kind of an influence of social media, of social media that people, and also experience, people are learning how to cut corners, how to not read a text, how to just do the minimum on a dis discussion board. Uh, just a few high fives and likes and things like that, just so that they look like that they're physically there, but they're actually not really engaged. And it was interesting as we were talking about this and what we've been doing, doing about it. And of course, there's a lot of literature on this going way back to 2003. Trisha Be Tisha Benders asking, the question remains as to how deeply information is being processed. Now, I mean, we can ask that in a real classroom as well, but, you know, you can see the whites of their eyes in a real classroom. You cannot see the 
not really the whites of their eyes in a online classroom, especially if they turn their cameras off. And of course, we've got, you know, various crit critiques of uh, uh, educational technology is becoming apparent that wired students use technology less, less to learn than to distract themselves from learning. We all know the uh, temptations of distractions of mobile phones, etc. Uh, and the book by Nicholas Carl that came out a few years ago talked about the shallowness of the way that we process uh, digital text. That uh, they offer massive input, the internet, but at the lowest level of engagement, a technology of forgetfulness. And he goes on to say, when we go online uh, and we enter an environment that promotes cursory reading and hurried and distracted thinking, uh, and superficial learning and we you know i mean and this is the problem so what do we do about it on a course like a master's course where it's critical that people are engaging with the content well i've started introducing i mean can you believe it quizzes i mean it's so corny but i do a okay the verb phrase summary of quizzes not evaluated but it's it's a chance for them to test themselves to see how much they've taken in but i mean it's a very uh it's a dip stick kind of attempt but a very what's the analogy i'm trying to say here it's a very <laughs> non uh unsearching or let's say it's not um it doesn't actually tell me very much but it's just it's, it's there to remind them that they are meant to read the text at least uh, and engage with the material but i think i mean going back i think that is one of the single biggest challenges that i've met okay let's move on uh Oh, what related to engagement is presence and presence in a sense is the antidote to to disengagement if you can be present yourself chances are that you will increase the degree of engagement on the part of the learners even if it's in it's asynchronous so presence doesn't mean being there in real time necessarily although of course it can but it also means being present during the evolution of each kind of unit and of course in the stages that it goes through that you are there and seen to be there we had i remember we had one of our very first instructors bless her the students were complaining because she was never she she didn't she was never at the, any of the discussions and we kept going back she said yes i am yes i am and I, i'd go into the discussion she said, but, but you haven't posted and she said oh they don't know that i've read their posts uh, even if i don't oh, know they don't know you have to reply <laughs> they don't they're not psychic, um, but that, you know, that's all part of the training thing, which I'll come to. Uh, you, the presence is like responding, uh, uh, and it's such an important aspect of online learning, uh, and, and, and perhaps the most single biggest difference from on-site learning. It appears that in the absence of opportunities for synchronous moment-by-moment -moment negotiated meaning that occurs in the classroom, Good teaching presence matters to an even greater extent. It's like really stating the obvious, but you have to be present. Uh, and in the evaluations on our courses, and these are some of the comments that students have, have made, this issue of presence comes up again and again. I appreciate that the instructor is always involved in the class and that she reads everything. This course of success is for me due to the way the instructor involved and engaged us. And the instructor's disciplined attention to all of us made a huge difference to the learning process. Uh, and one way, of course, that you can be pre present is by constantly announcing things and reminding learners, not nagging. And so on our announcement, uh, the announcement part of the course, there are frequent, as you can see, virtually every two or three days, I'm announcing something or other. That's one way of reminding learners of our presence. Interactivity. Um, well, I've shown you, I showed you that screencast of the responses to that first socializing task. So you get an idea if you don't know what a discussion board looks like. This is what a discussion board looks like. Uh, this is from the older iteration of the course on, when it was on Blackboard, but you can see uh, the threads and the responses, etc. Uh, and it's very interesting looking at um, the balance between the students and the instructors, particularly over this period of a course, the instructors perhaps having to intervene less because the learners have been, in a sense, 
seen models of intervention and trained to uh, respond to each other because they know each other better. Uh, a lot of work is being done, a lot of interesting research into the kinds of uh, uh, interventions that an, an instructor has uh, as options. And I think you know, these are some that I've, this is a list I made just looking at my own, the way, like, trying to recollect, how is it that I respond when people uh, post on a, on a discussion board? Well, you validate. Great. Fantastic. I mean, we don't have a like thing. We voted to take that off. Uh, it's an option on Canvas, but I just felt it was too super, superficial. If people are just liking everything but not commenting. So, um, and similarly for the instructor. So the instructor says things like, that's a well-argued response to the question. Well, focusing. So hang on. Yeah, you've not really answered the question. The question is less about first language acquisition than second language acquisition. So probing. Now, this is perhaps one of the most important. Can you, exp can you explain? So finishing with a question, reformulating. So trying to, and this is part of like introducing them to the discourse of academic discourse. So somebody said something in a really relatively colloquial way about language learning. You say, ah, so what you're saying is that um, scaffolding the input is more important than blah, 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 that kind of thing. And then sometimes there's things that you disagree with. So you just challenge them. Well, I wonder if it's really the case that, what do you think? So these are the kinds of elaborating. So then you would give, uh, ah, this is when you reach behind you for your into your library and say, yes, actually, good point. Um, Michael Long said that in 2015 when he described blah, 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 elaborations, in fact. Uh, and exemplifying, giving examples, particularly from your own experience. Uh, they like that and they will do the same if they're invited to. And finally, try to wrapping it up. So I think we generally agree that blah, blah, blah. Now, these interventions, when you think about the interventions in a classroom, which are so much more simple and that kind of like the initiate response follow-up kind of thing what's the capital of peru lima good this is a much more sophisticated set of interventions that are available and these i think what make the discussion boards the real learning uh locus of the whole thing it's the discussion boards it's the discussion boards where it happens and this is what they say. And we canvass their opinions quite early on. And this is one student says, I think the discussion boards are great. First, I was very skeptical. Um, I, and that's encouraging that the discussion boards kind of overrode his or her initial skepticism and uh, and doubts. Um, and I think, uh, and another one says that the discussion board is where most of my aha moments with the subject happen. Either someone will bring up a point that clarifies a theory or we will discuss this theory to death from all angles, which helps to digest a new idea or topic. The collective brain of the class which is extremely helpful in ironing out ideas. I didn't say that, she said that the collective brain of the class. Um, but we have to have rules about the discussion boards and some of the rules, I'm not going to, I'm going to go through these briefly, they're kind of adapted from Grice's cooperative principles. Be brief, be relevant, be explicit, you know, make it clear what you're talking about, be original, don't just cut and paste, uh, and be appropriate. And this is all about the tone uh, and also related to that be courteous never has been a problem actually of people we've never had very few flaming incidents and all this time uh i can't put i can't i can't say why uh but it's just been the case that people have been incredibly nice to each other okay we're nearly there feedback i said engagement was the most then i said presence was the most important thing no the most important thing is feedback and it's part of the interactive cycle, if you like. In almost all cases, students say that effective procedures for instructor or tutor or peer feedback are the most important features of a successful online course. Wow. And that was way back in 2001. Um, the feedback, I'll just skip that, can take the form of feedback on the written, their written work and on Canvas and I imagine on other platforms, there are these neat things whereby I can annotate uh, their um, assignments. So they've done an assignment, language analysis. On the right are my annotations, which connect with the highlighted bits and that kind of thing. Takes a lot of time, uh, but you know, 
would anyway in any kind of classroom and it's really appreciated i was amazed at how carefully dot 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 read my assignments i think that encouraged me to try much harder than i might have otherwise knowing he was going to really take the time to engage with what i wrote made me feel so respected i'm a hard worker i'm not sure i would have worked this hard for another teacher another one says i have never received such helpful feedback from an instructor in my entire academic life i'm not going to say uh, who that was about i'm going to move on because we've got one more thing uh which is training that's what i've learned because i wasn't trained it was all about self formation is that a word uh in my experience i had come from some background on online courses i had been involved with an online language course and setting that up and working with that for a number of years but really going into teaching uh on a master's course online i was just dumped into it uh there was zero training little mentorship uh we met periodically online to discuss things mainly you know technical things actually um, but there wasn't a lot of training and yet training would seem to be of the essence because it's not the same as teaching face to face and T D David Noonan just as learning at a distance is quite as learning at a distance is quite different from learning face to face so too is teaching while some skills transfer from face to face to virtual classrooms others do not and oh boy I mean as a kind of I was the sort of on-site trainer really and we had people who had came with fantastic references for classroom teaching but they just simply could not adapt just didn't understand and uh you know with more time more formalized training routes that might have been um avoided the problems we had and then finally another long quote sorry So what this is saying is that the experience, the different kinds of experience learners have had on online courses, it's all down to the tutor, the situated practice of individual tutors. It's not about the design of the course. It's not about the other learners. It's not about, uh, 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 it's about the individual tutors, just as it is in real classrooms. And this also relates to the uh, tutor's own attitudes and beliefs. So, um, if, if I were to start again on our program, uh, I would look seriously at this pyramid, which is a sort of skills pyramid of uh, what the skills alert, an online instructor needs to acquire and in the order that they are probably acquired, starting at the bottom of the pyramid, in information and communication technology, like, you know, how to open a PowerPoint. Um, and then moving up through specific competences and the particular software that they're using, uh, being able to deal with the constraints and the possibilities of the medium. Online socialization, I haven't talked about socialization, I just touched on it, but it's just like so important uh, as it is in any classroom, but doubly important in an online classroom. Facilitating communicative competence. So this is for teaching uh, languages um and then being starting to be creative with the medium and developing their own particular style but their own particular style is not the starting point okay i'm nearly done these are some of the things i would have loved to have talked about but i couldn't fit in but we can maybe if you've got questions about them um cannot overestimate the importance of having a good technical support system uh the necessity of instructors being ever vigilant even though you're not there physically, you've got to have your eyes and ears open, peeled, and deal with things as quickly as possible. Right? So we didn't have flaming incidents much, but absenteeism was a problem. Your own time management and pacing. Uh, it turns out, because all our teachers were teaching during the week, that they did all their posting in the weekend, which meant effectively for 10, 14 years, I lost my weekends. Um, plagiarism i haven't talked about the way that the trainer can model and scaffold the kind of interactions i sort of touched on maintaining motivation and involvement in the long haul uh that's important and then across the courses coordinating we have lots of courses on our program 
uh, a lot taught by lots of different instructors. How do you standardize? What kind of coordination do you have? Do you have each course looking exactly the same? And then updating the courses. These things have been going for 10 years now. The references are all like pre 21st century. Uh, how do you keep updating it? It sounds like it's easy if it's online, but it, it's not necessarily. And it's a, it's a discipline. And finally, what about how do you deal with burnout? Uh, your burnout. And I'm kind of burnt out. So uh, I'm going to hand back to Gisela now, and then uh, we'll I'll come back uh, after she's done her presentation and answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. It was very interesting. And uh, it was actually so interesting to see how many of the things you said about the master's students in New York also apply to our own students at the CIM, at the Centre de Idiomas Moderns at WOC, where we teach languages online. And, and that I found that very amazing. So um, things like they they have this need for physical connection, right? They love to see their instructors. That's something we see every now and then in our courses. They they are somehow some there is some reluctancy towards synchronicity. So they definitely prefer asynchronous modalities, despite this need for physical connection they have. The virtual presence, you talked about the virtual presence, and that's something that we encourage our instructors all the time to be physical, not physically, virtually present, because there is this clear correlation between their involvement, their presence, and students' involvement and presence as well. And what else? Well, yeah, these are the, the main the main similarities I I just I just saw. And I I found it really, really interesting. So thank you so much again. Um, I'm going to now switch back to Spanish again. Voy a volver al, al español para otra vez volver a hablar del, del máster, que es el motivo principal que nos reúne aquí hoy. Um, voy a daros más detalles sobre este máster en enseñanza y aprendizaje de idiomas mediante la tecnología. Os voy a explicar un poco la estructura que tiene. Um, hay un, un bloque de, de asignaturas obligatorias que comprende 30 créditos, son 5 asignaturas en total, y luego hay 18 créditos que provienen de asignaturas opt optativas, que ahora os enseñaré cuáles son. El programa también incluye un trabajo final de máster, un TFM que es obligatorio, e incluye unas prácticas que son obligatorias, que se pueden convalidar en ciertos casos, pero que en principio son obligatorias. Um, Aquí tenéis una visión global de lo que sería el, el máster en bloques con los 30 créditos obligatorios que son de asignaturas de fundamentos donde se introducen teorías de aprendizaje y de enseñanza de, de lenguas, de segundas lenguas. Luego tenemos los bloques optativos, uno más enfocado hacia enfoques pedagógicos, para la redundancia, herramientas y, y recursos y otro que sería el de investigación en e-learning. Luego ya tenemos las prácticas y el trabajo de final de máster. Os doy un poco más de información sobre las asignaturas concretas. Esta sería, sería todo lo que estamos ofreciendo eh, ahora mismo, que, que vamos a ofrecer a partir de octubre. El bloque de asignaturas obligatorias incluye asignaturas como introducción a la enseñanza y el aprendizaje de idiomas en línea, tendencias en el aprendizaje de segundas lenguas mediante la tecnología, fundamentos de la adquisición de segundas lenguas mediante la tecnología, estrategias de feedback, y la evaluación de competencias en contextos de aprendizaje en línea. Las asignaturas optativas y que ya son más específicas, no tan, no tan enfocadas a, a los fundamentos generales del aprendizaje y la enseñanza, son el enfoque por tareas, el aprendizaje integrado de contenidos y lenguas extranjeras o ICLE, una introducción a la gamificación y el aprendizaje colaborativo en línea. Después tenemos las asignaturas optativas de métodos de la investigación, tanto métodos de investigación en línea como técnicas de análisis, que también son optativas, y vendría después ya el máster y las prácticas o practicum, cada uno con seis créditos. Información adicional, um, brevemente, los criterios de admisión. El perfil de ingreso que recomendamos es el de un licenciado graduado en una rama de filología, educación, educación infantil o primaria, con especialidad en lengua, cualquier lengua pero en lengua, y traducción e interpretación. 
los estudiantes que no tengan este perfil pueden acceder si demuestran un mínimo de dos años en experiencia docente o pedagógica en un idioma o bien están en posesión de un título de especialización que puede ser un máster um, orientado a la enseñanza o también podría ser un certificado que los capacita para la enseñanza de un idioma, el Celta o, o incluso el Delta que ha mencionado Scott anteriormente. Hay un requisito que es nivel de competencia en lengua inglesa o lengua española según el idioma que se escoja para la docencia que tendría que ser equivalente al B2, según el marco común europeo de referencia. Y si os estáis preguntando, pues, ¿por qué estudiar este máster ¿no? en, en, en la Universidad Tuberta de Cataluña y no otro máster en otro sitio? Os voy a dar unas, unas cuantas razones. Una de ellas es que es un máster enfocado a, a la enseñanza y al aprendizaje de idiomas con la tecnología como eje vertebrador. No es, la tecnología no aparece como una asignatura optativa o electiva, sino que intenta ser la, el vínculo entre todas las asignaturas que ofrecemos en el programa. Tiene la marca WOC. Um, son 25 años de experiencia en la enseñanza de idiomas a través del Centro de Idiomas Modernos. Es un programa en línea asíncrono y bilingüe. Y al ser en línea asíncrono, pues se adapta muy bien a las necesidades uh, pues, de trabajo, familiares que cada uno pueda tener. Las prácticas, que he dicho que en algunos casos se podrán convalidar, se pueden hacer virtuales, pero también presenciales si el estudiante aporta un, un centro de de enseñanza donde, donde él trabaja normalmente. Tenemos un amplio equipo de profesores y colaboradores docentes, hay profesores en activo que están enseñando idiomas, tenemos profesores con proyectos de um, investigación y desarrollo en curso. Aquí tenéis los nombres de algunas de las profesoras y del, y del, del, del profesor del equipo ¿no? que, hemos, que hemos estado trabajando en este, en este máster. Y finalmente deciros que, que es tenéis una matrícula que es flexible, que podéis decidir pues, hacer el máster en un año completo o bien en más de un año a tiempo parcial. No es necesario hacerlo en un año completo. Y ya para acabar, además del máster, estamos ofreciendo cursos de especialización que cubren parte de las asignaturas de ese máster. Son cursos de 18 créditos. Uno de, ellos, uno de estos cursos de especialización se llama ICLE CLIL y el enfoque por tareas mediante la tecnología y este, esta, especializ esta especialización se ofrece en el primer semestre de, entre octubre y febrero y el segundo curso de especialización es sobre gamificación y aprendizaje colaborativo de idiomas mediante la tecnología que se ofrece en segundo semestre entre marzo y julio. Y por mi parte, pues nada más, animaros a, a consultar los, los detalles del máster en esta, en esta página web. Tenéis aquí mi correo electrónico, um, podéis contactarme en cualquier momento si necesitáis más información y, y muchísimas gracias por, por vuestra atención. Voy a volver ahora con, con Scott y empezaremos el turno de preguntas y respuestas. Hi Scott again. Hi Gisela. Can I wait? I'd love to do this course. I'd love to do it. I wish I did it. As I said before, I wish I could have done it 12 years ago. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> did we get some questions, um, Scott, for you? Um, have you been able to have a look? Yes. Uh, I have uh, been. Uh, yes, I'll just scroll back. Um, okay. I, I, there's a lot of questions here. I'll try and deal with them. Uh, rapidly um the question was what was asked uh what proportion of different multimedia is desirable on asynchronous and I, i think this has a lot to do with the subject um in our courses i'm teaching the language analysis course uh, but there are other people teaching methodology etc and they need to be showing videos of classroom teaching and they need to be showing that students themselves need to be uploading videos of themselves teaching. I mean, so there's a very different kind of thing than a more linguistics focused course. I think it has a lot to do with the subject matter, but it also has a lot to do with the students and the kind of bandwidth that they have. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to put, but the, the amount of text should not, I think the, the text should be print text major, majorly so that they're reading, they've got articles that they can download, PDFs or whatever, or they can access in an online library, or they've got a core text, a book, that they do the reading not on as much as possible. Um, then the question, 
good question. How can you know if learners are engaged engaged in an asynchronous context? How do you know that they're engaged? And I don't, I mean, this is the problem. You don't. I mean, this is why we're turning back somersaults, trying to think of ways that we can, like, check that they really are engaged. And I think, um, but then how do you know that they're engaged in synchronous contexts often? I mean, <laughs> we've all had students in class who their eyes are still open, but they're clearly, as they say in Arabic, they're in the garden. Um, uh, I don't know. I guess... And in a real context, in a face-to-face -face one, or in a synchronous online context, you ask them questions. Um, but that doesn't work so easily or directly in a, in a uh, asynchronous one. I, I think it really is a challenge. We do have, I have to say, we do have uh, tools which we surveillance. I mean, they're a bit creepy. But the program we have, we can go in and we can see how many times an, uh, a student has logged on and uh, how many pages they've looked at, et cetera. So we kind of know their participation, but that doesn't tell us how engaged they were with the pages that they logged into. So this is where trying to think of, you know, t quizzes, tests, discussions. And I think perhaps this is why there's pressure from the university to say, well, let's do more uh, synchronous sessions from time to time, because there's a better chance that students will be engaged. But we, we know this from Zoom, that people can just turn their camera off and they can be in another room. Another question, does the greater depth of, ref now this is a, yeah, this is a good one too. Does the greater depth of reflection afforded by asynchronous context, in addition to the lack of spontaneity, okay, so the two things, the, there's more time to reflect, there's less spontaneity, but does, is there a risk of the students being under-challenged? Uh, that's a good question. And I mean, there are different degrees of challenge built into the course. So there are, uh, there are, People in the discussion boards, people could sort of contribute to the level of their own particular experience and interests. And we don't hold people back. Don't say, well, that's a bit too academic or whatever. No, just go for it. On the other hand, there's people who won't contribute because they may be inhibited by people who are like showing off. Uh, and my advice to them is always ask questions. If you don't feel you can add anything to the discussion, just ask a question. Say, what do you mean by that? Or how does that apply to the classroom? Um, but we have other, we have more formal tasks. As I said, we have the as assignments that they have to do, and those can, those do require. Yeah, you know, they're academic assignments. They're at master's level. They do uh, challenge the learners. Um, another question: Do you think that what's been called emergency remote teaching is here to stay? And, and I think it's not, hopefully, because and for, for the very reason that there are courses like the one that's being launched today that are doing what perhaps should have been done some time ago because i mean even without the, the virus we knew that this was coming people have been talking about blended learning flipped classrooms uh people have been teaching online for years uh to support themselves often as while they maintain a job and a, an academy or whatever we've known about this but there hasn't i mean there have been there are organizations like consultancy e etc who do do very good training sessions but people are not encouraged to do these by their institutions necessarily so I hope we move away from emergency remote teaching to informed and principled online teaching uh, as soon as possible. And we will. I mean, it's been a very steep learning curve for everybody uh, in the last three months. Uh, hopefully what will emerge from this will be a better prepared uh, teaching core of teachers who are able to do both kinds of teaching successfully. Um, Joe asked. Hello, Joe. Um, Online discussions can be great. Yes, they can also be a flop. Uh, a very good quick Ideas for effective discussion task design. First of all, don't overdo the tasks. Just one task at a time. We had people writing on our course. There was three or four different discussion tasks. Do one, and every two days it changed. No, 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 no. Give them a week. Give them time. One task. Or if it's got a number of questions, say, answer three of these questions or two of these questions. And that's one of the conditions that, that, uh, that also they have to respond to at least two or three posts of other students to get things kind of flowing. Sometimes it is like ah, pushing whales up a beach. I mean, it's not easy to get things going. Certain groups like in real classrooms just don't buzz and there's no real interaction. Uh, and so you have to be more um, proactive 
uh, and ask those kind of questions which um, push them a little bit, those probing questions. But I think in terms of the task design, um, tasks which uh, encourage a degree of personal experience, and also this is an antidote against plagiarism, incidentally, something I meant to mention, but if you say, how have you in your classrooms taught the conditionals or whatever, or what materials do you recommend, or what, etc., so that they're bringing to the discussion some real experience, and they love that. I mean, the others were really appreciated. It was free teaching ideas for a start. I mean, if that's not the topic, but I think somehow personalizing it, or at least at some point in the discussion, one of the related questions is, well, so, so, so how is this relevant to you in your particular teaching context, uh, is one suggestion. How are we going? Uh, Matthew asks, um, what might you say are your favorite activities, formats, or modalities to improve engagement in students? Skype live sessions, discussion, for example, just Skype live sessions, discussions are more... Per now, the Skype live sessions is interesting because we, as I said before, we have this kind of mid-semester uh, tutorial where it's, uh, in, they, it's optional that they can uh, sign up for a Skype session with their instructor. So it's like office hours, basically. And it's interesting how, ma how many don't do that. And I don't know why. And I'm not sure if they don't see the value of it or just they're too busy. Or, uh, and then the ones who do seem to appreciate it. And the feedback at the end of the course is, oh, yes, I really liked having the Skype conversation. But the ones who didn't do it don't seem to miss it. So I don't know. I mean, it's a drag, I have to say, um, for me because of the time zone thing. That often, you know, I'm up, at, it's like 12 at night or something talking to somebody because of the time in California or whatever. Um, so I don't, <laughs> I don't push them to do it. But um, so, I mean, and, uh, yeah. So coming back to the question, my favorite activities. Um, yes, I mean, I mentioned discussions of more personal sharing. Um, definitely, although, I mean, at the same time, because on our program, we have people with vast range of experience. Some people have hardly ever talked before. Some people who are, uh, uh, have got 15 years teaching experiences. So you have to kind of be careful that you don't you don't get somebody who's just constantly showing off what they've done. Uh, that's the problem, bringing in the ones who are more reticent. Uh, and similarly, where there's questions about language, where some of them have done, you know, masters in linguistics before, uh, they, you've got to kind of, uh, it's not that kind of course, this is for teachers, etc. So I haven't really answered that question, but we'll move on because Rebecca says, how significant do you think is the role of training and guiding students and how to use these systems? So, well, yeah, absolutely. And, and this is why, again, coming back to this, we're cautious about over-egging uh, the cake that we don't ask our students to download 20 different apps um, because they're going to have to learn how to use each one of them. And they, they're not necessarily intuitive. Uh, we've all discovered this to our cost. And uh, I, I think one assumes that students on the whole are more tech savvy now, but you can't make that assumption. Uh, this whole thing about digital natives, etc., has been called into question as you well know. So, but yes, absolutely, training, training, training. And I didn't mention, I mean, I mentioned it in my nine things I would like to talk about, the absolutely critical importance of having the best technical support um, just in time at your fingertips, technical support that is so in language or in our language too that the learners can understand uh, so that they know whenever they're, because you don't want to be bothered as the instructor when somebody says, Oh, I couldn't open the PDF because I, or I couldn't read your con. No, 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 that's not my problem. I'm doing it all right. I know I am because I've been doing this for 12 years. You've got a problem at your end. If you can't solve it, get in touch with the helpline. Punto. Gisela, I think. Uh, yeah. It's over to you. Is there a question for me or oh, you mean there are uh, no more? Oh. <laughs> Oh, no, there isn't. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, there's one more from Jessica. Jessica, um, I know that name. Teaching older adults and some younger ones, learning how to use the tech can sometimes take precedence over the subject. Yeah. Um, 
and often this may be being done in a language uh, in the, the language that they're learning so you could argue oh well this is good practice for them but not if they don't understand it, it could be doubly frustrating um how can we cope jessica asked with the cognitive overload in, involved in learning how to use the text uh, the tech uh which can take precedence over the subject and i think just in sort of baby steps basically uh, introduce one thing at a time and this is again why it's important not to overload the program with apps and stuff personally even though there's some great stuff out there let them discover it and that's the other thing i mean when they're sharing stuff they say oh i found that i mean i find this more and more that now people are sharing particularly youtube videos on stuff like jazz chants you know somebody finds that and they upload it and everything oh this is fabulous um they're doing that much easier than they used to and mine are older adults i mean but they seem to be much more savvy now knowing how to upload images and and connect to youtube things and that sort of thing so that's kind of good one hopes that this is you know uh a, 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 this progression will continue will be less less anxiety associated with uh teaching them to use the tech okay jackie asks how can you task design yeah to avoid plagiarism a very good question we don't actually use a plagiarism check kind of like software but i know that they exist and they i know that uh many universities use them uh for everything for both online and on-site uh assignments and and uh, and that they are pretty um pretty good we haven't found a problem one reason is because in my course at least i set assignments that they can't find an answer to anywhere so i'll set an assignment like you've got to find um a text so let's say we're doing the noun phrase you've got to find a text online and you've got to annotate that text for these kinds of features all the noun phrases post modification pre modification blah 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 you know uh and then you've got to say how you would use that then you've got to evaluate the readability of that text using some kind of online tool and then you've got to say how you would teach that text or exploit that text in the classroom Now, there's no way they're going to find an answer to that online now that's that works for the language analysis course and i think it works more or less for the other courses too is where they are uh, invited to talk about their experience or their own opinion uh and that's one way you can sort of filter out oh this cut and paste it does, it's not i mean people have slipped through the net uh and it's difficult and embarrassing and you have to have to deal with it instantly and you have to deal with it off site you can't say on the discussion board oh i think you copied that no you you send them a um and they go oh i didn't realize i couldn't gisella um yes no more questions i i believe right nothing no questions about the master's degree <laughs> all those questions were for for scott ah <laughs> i believe yeah <laughs> nothing for me <laughs> <laughs> but can I, uh, Jose? Can I just mm -hmm. ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Curiosity. I should have asked you this beforehand. But what are, are you using a sort of homegrown platform for the delivery of the course, or are you using something like Canvas or Blackboard for, your, are, for the master's course? We are using the university's platform. Right. So okay. The same, just the same classroom, virtual classroom we have for okay. teaching languages. Okay. okay. So it has all those basic functionalities that I was showing, like you know, announcements and. Uh, assignments and discussions and everything yeah uh, it does have yeah mm -hmm. exactly and it's fairly um intuitive i'm i'm hoping because it's been tried and tested over generations of students now right well this goes back to jessica's question right we we kind of make sure that students get all the tutorials they need it's very important that at the beginning of the course they get used to the different spaces to the tools Mm -hmm. So we definitely put some time in that because it's it's essential, especially with the type of student profile we we get at this university. And we, I guess, also answering Jessica and, and you mentioned that point. Simplicity is is key in here, right? So if if you can complete one task with one tool, what's the point of 
using multiple tools just for the sake of showing off the tools that doesn't make sense maybe you don't even need the tool to to complete that task so it's so it's really important not to lose sight of that of that component you mentioned and um do you, would you agree i mean in terms of the design of the course that the the reading the readings for the course a lot of that is just traditional print reading that you know like books or articles or stuff that they can download from the university online library would that be the case or is all the text online we do have some more traditional chapters and papers but we do create our own materials as well okay. and we tend to build up our courses in a very interactive mm -hmm. fashion so there's a lot of discussion going on materials tend to be also very interactive mm -hmm. um, and there is always a, a task going on in the classroom one mm -hmm. way or another so they are very Active. We try to involve students as much as possible. We follow a little bit the, the, the pattern or the design we have for the language courses in that sense. Right. Okay. And uh, in terms of standardization, I mentioned this and things I didn't talk about, but is it, I once was asked to design a course for a university in London and the, they supplied me with a template. So and I was doing the second language acquisition course, but the, every single course had to follow that template. It was very, very structured. Uh, Whereas our course, we decided for whatever reason, when we were designing, we would let individual tutors or instructors design their own courses to give their own kind of, you know, character or personality. Mm -hmm. But it, it had negative consequences because people, so the students find no consistency between the two different, you know, for the different courses. In your case, is each course, does it, is it plugged into a particular template? So each course looks more or less the same. Well, they're addressing competences in common, and that's something that um, we all share and tries to mm -hmm. unify unify us all. And um, we do make sure that we don't overlap. We we work as a very close team, so we we are not those many working in the courses. Mm -hmm. So so there is I, I would say there is there is some room for the instructor to bring in their own exp expertise, but we also make sure that there is an internal cohesion and coherence among among the, these different courses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually very important from the student's perspective, apart from anything else. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, I have one question here, process of admission. What's the process of admission? Um, so the uh, registration is open right now, if if that's that's what this person is asking about. There is a way of um, requesting information which doesn't doesn't commit anyone to to register for these masters but gives you the opportunity to be in a in the virtual classroom itself to get familiar with the with how it works how it looks and to answer any questions um that the potentially interested person has and i i just recommend recommend you to check the website there is there's actually a website in english and one in spanish and um, request the information de acceso, petición de acceso, something is called like this. And um, you, you will be placed in this virtual classroom with a tutor, um, an excellent tutor who will guide you and answer your questions without any further uh, commitment on, on your side. If you are in the end interested to register, you can register, otherwise you, you don't have to register. And Jessica is asking, what's the proportion of synchronous versus asynchronous study? Um, this is defined as an asynchronous master's degree. Now, because of what I was telling um, Scott, every every professor, every instructor has some flexibility to create their own tasks. There may be there, there may be courses that require um, synchronicity among the students at some particular points, but that would be a very small percentage uh, over the total of the course, which is going to be mostly asynchronous. So, uh, and this synchronicity will never be between instructor and student. It will always be between students who will have to coordinate at some point, perhaps for some of the courses, probably for the most specialized practical ones, not for the fundamental basic courses. And I think this is the last question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess we we are finishing on time. <laughs> I would just like to thank Scott Thornbury again for for his talk and for his thought-provoking ideas. 
and I, I hope we can see each other soon, <laughs> physically, <laughs> in the near future. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Giselle, and good luck with the with the course, the program. It looks like it's going to be great. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Hold on a sec. I think there is one last last question, last minute question. Laya, Laya Canals is helping us, by the way, with with the uh, monitoring of well, the. Thank you, Laya. You've done yeah, a great thank job. Thank you, thank you, Laya, so much. Um, question is now coming through the app. Okay, yeah, Jessica. <laughs> ah. so it would be suitable for people who are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure, Jessica. This master's degree is suitable for people who are working. Actually, um, our university uh, is basically, um, our students are basically, they basically belong to this profile. So they are working professionals, they busy people with families, and we always bear that in mind. And that's why I said that the registration is flexible in the sense that you can, you can complete the whole degree in one year, or you can just break it down into um, several years, as, as as many semesters as you need to to complete it. So I would say it's very suitable for for that kind of setup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember that if you have any more questions, you can always you have my email. Um, you can always contact me anytime. You can go to the walks uh, to the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya's website and find the information about the masters, find me and contact me anytime. I will be very happy to answer any questions you, you may have. So if there is nothing else, I would just close the session. Thank all the, all the audience, all of you who have been with us here uh, today. Um, and thank you, Scott. Thank you, the technicians. Thank you, Laya. And um, we close this session. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye.